In today's video, we're gonna go over some creepy TikTok conspiracies. Let's get into it. The doctors are lying to us and I can prove it. I went in for a wellness checkup and got called back and was told that I need to get back to see the doctor. I need to get back ASAP. The problem was nobody would tell me anything that was going on over the phone, said I had to come into the office. So I made my way back to the office and at least they got me in right away so I could see him. I didn't have to wait forever. He told me that my results had come back in, that I needed to get all metformin and Lipitor immediately, or I was gonna have a stroke, heart attack, or possibly die because my LDL cholesterol was 397, my triglycerides was 498, I was 6.2 A1C, pre-diabetic, I had neuropathy, I had acid reflux, and he said, I need to take the drugs. I told him I really didn't want to take the drugs, I'd figure out a different way to do it, and he got a little bit what I would call passionate and told me there was no way for me to do it by myself. No diet or exercise was going to matter. This was heredity. This was genetic. I needed to take Lipitor and Metformin, uh, Big Farmer's drugs, because I couldn't do it by myself. Fast forward from that visit, my LDL cholesterol is now 76 from 397. My triglycerides is 110, coming from 498. My pre-diabetic A1AC was at 6.2, now it's at 5. No more neuropathy, no more acid reflux. Upon further conversation with the doctor, I find out that he wasn't lying to me. He just really didn't know. He, that's what he was taught. He said they don't do much by way of training in med school for nutrition. It was interesting to watch how it made him rethink his whole pharmaceutical mindset as I shared with him the protocol that I use is all natural, there's negative side effects, is every bit as good as metformin and Lipitor, which he saw in my blood work, uh, and also that it was in the PDR, which used to be the physician's desk reference, which is now the prescriber's digital reference, a trusted source that he trusts. I'd let him know that he could look it up and he could learn more about it. I hope to see you on the good side of health. Hey, I always really enjoy hearing people that's bettered themselves when they were in a really tight or horrible spot. And I wish that he would have shown the actual proof. Again, he, he really said, I can prove it, but he never really showed proof. He never showed paperwork, blood checkup work, anything like that. He just basically said, hey, this is what the doctor said. This is what I said, and this is how it is. So it makes it not necessarily hard to believe, but I would like to see the facts, you know? But I do believe that the medical system here in America specifically is a horrible system that tries to suppress you. And I'm not blaming the doctors. It's like this individual said. That's how they were taught. And I'm a big believer in trying to keep it natural, trying to find what fixes us, because I'm a huge believer that there is something natural out there that can fix your problem. What do you guys think about this? Do you think that there's stuff out there that can actually be good home remedies that truly solve the problem or things that you can find out in nature can actually help heal you and avert you from these symptoms? Or do you think that maybe going to the doctors is the better way of doing it and we're just trying to be as cheap as possible by not going to the doctors? We're gonna talk about one of my favorite things in all of horror, the SCP Foundation. Buckle up, because this is going to be long and nerdy. In fact, also, I've been listening to SCP narrations every night before bed for the last 10 years. I can't sleep without them anymore. It's a problem. If you're just starting to get into the universe, you have no idea what I'm talking about. Let's start from the very beginning. There are two things in the SCP Foundation that you need to know. The SCP Foundation itself and the anomalies. The anomalies can range from anything like SCP-999, which is basically just a big ass blob that acts like a dog is extremely playful and if it touches you, you just become extremely happy. Like, oh my god, I love it. All the way to something like SCP-682, also known as the unkillable reptile. It's called that because it looks vaguely reptilian, even though they have no idea where the fuck this thing came from, and also, they can't kill it. This thing is hyper aggressive, it wants to kill everything that it sees because it hates life, and like I said, it can't be killed, so the only way they can contain it is by putting it in a 5 meter by 5 meter by 5 meter tub of acid. That's the only way they can contain this thing. Basically anything abnormal can be an anomaly. For example, Bigfoot, Wendigo, Skinwalkers, anomalies. On the other end of the spectrum, you have the SCP Foundation. SCP literally stands for Secure, Contain, Protect. Their job is to capture any anomaly, whether it be benign and harmless, all the way to it could end the fucking world and it is a god. They have to capture it and contain it so that they can study it. Don't be fooled. These guys may technically be the good guys, 
but they do some super shady shit. For example, they have something called the D-Class. The D-Class is a literal death row inmate that they bring into the foundation to use as cannon fodder. What that means is that if they capture an anomaly and have no idea what it is, they'll just throw a D-Class in there, and if the D-Class dies, all they get from it is, oh, this anomaly kills things. We should probably up its containment procedures, huh? Also, I don't remember what anomaly it is, but I remember they would just throw D-Classes into the containment area just for, like, food. Just to feed, like, whatever the anomaly was. It's some crazy shit. Of course, the SCP Foundation is an extremely dangerous job, and a lot of them die. Sometimes when an anomaly breaks out, it kills everyone in the entire site or the containment facility. That's why their slogan is the hardest fucking thing I've ever heard. Their slogan is, we die in the dark, so you may live in the light. Holy shit! Now that you have the general gist of what these are, I want to tell you some of my favorites. SCP-701, also known as A Hanged King's Tragedy. This is a five-act play. Every time this play is performed, it gets more and more deranged. For example, in the latest iteration that I've read, it was performed at a high school in 2016. I believe it was Act 4, where one of the actors took a knife and cut his belly open, spilling his guts all over the stage. And then another actress came up and grabbed the knife from him and says, the hanged king demands a sacrifice or some shit, and slices his throat clean open, spilling his blood all over the stage. What about the audience? What was their reactions? Hold on, okay? In Act 5, at the end of Act 5, the audience just suddenly starts killing each other. Not like hitting each other, like literally killing each other with their bare hands. And if they survive that, they exit the venue and they also try and kill everyone that they see. And that lasts from anywhere from 24 to 48 hours. Of course, there's a lot more detail and why it's called a Hang King's Tragedy, but if you want to know more about that, you should just read the SCP for yourself. Does the Black Moon howl? No, not yet. SCP-001, the Black Moon. Now, this is not the first SCP. There is just an entire lore behind why there's so many SCP-001s that it could be its own separate video. It's really hard to explain what the black moon is without actually reading the SCP, so I'm going to try my best. It's not even a fucking moon. It is a unseeable thing in the universe that just kills things. I'm sorry, it makes things cease to exist. Like, when it does strike someone, they freeze in place, turn black as coal, and then just crumble to dust. This is the only SCP that I can remember that goes until the end of time. Like the story extends to the end of the universe. It's not that I don't want to, it's that I literally cannot explain this thing to you in words. Go on to YouTube, go to SCP Explained and watch their animation of the Black Moon. That's the best thing I can give to you. And the last one that is my personal favorite is SCP-084, aka the Radio Tower. This one isn't over the top lethal, it's just... When you walk towards it, no matter how long you walk towards it, it will always be the same distance away from you. Not only that, but as soon as you enter a certain radius around its containment area, you will be stuck there forever. How that works is when you walk towards the broadcast tower, it will be the same distance away from you no matter how long you walk. And if you try and exit, it will be the exact same thing. You will always be just out of reach of the exit forever. You also can't die when you're in its containment area. For example, there is a town inside of its containment area that the people just can't die. Also, this likes to shift reality a bit, which like shifts the buildings and people in the town. So sometimes the buildings will shift and the people will shift and they'll just be stuck in the walls in excruciating pain, screaming and waiting until the next reality shift, which could be for the next couple years. But anyway, those are just scratching the surface of the SCP universe. I highly recommend you guys getting into this because it is extremely lore heavy and extremely interesting to read about. You don't have to be like me and like buy the books and be a fucking nerd. You can just go online onto YouTube and listen to the narrations of SCPs. That's what I do every single night. I really enjoy SCPs. If there's anyone out there that likes cryptid creatures, things like that, this is an amazing concept of stories. It's none of it's real, of course. It's all fake. It's all fiction, but it's still really interesting. The stories that people come up with to create SCPs are really neat to me. So if any of you guys are interested in this type of content, let me know because I can implement it into my videos a little bit more often. I try to not keep the fake stuff in these videos, but I do still enjoy these nonetheless. So let me know.
Hey, if you haven't done so already, go ahead and like the video and subscribe to the channel. I only ask once per video and I make a video like this almost every day. And if you look at this graph, you'll see that 27% of the viewers that watch my content are actually subscribed to the channel, while 72% of the viewers that watch my content are not subscribed, but keep coming back for more of my content. So to the 27% that are subscribed to the channel, thank you so much. And to the 72% of people that are not subscribed, hey, I still appreciate you nonetheless. Thank you for watching. Okay, so researchers think the sun might be conscious. And now hold up, because this isn't the first time we've heard about stellar consciousness, is it? Not in a lot of different ways, it's not the first time. But there's also other numerous theories that have been suggested within science about neutron stars potentially being conscious, because they're made up of like an exotic form of matter, and they think that there's a good potential that persistent patterns could exist within it. Um, and there'd also be things like affecting it like time dilation and stuff that might allow some degree of stellar intelligence, at least inside of a neutron star. And who knows with some of these other crazy stellar, bod stel stellar bodies they got out there, right? Um, the, you know, the universe is a miraculous place. I'll tell you that right now. And if our sun is conscious, I, I don't know. Somebody owes somebody, like the ancient Egyptians a dollar or something because... Yeah, sun god, bam. Now this particular article is just about panpsychism, which is really that all things are conscious to a degree, but just like very small degrees for some things. But really that means that in a sufficiently complex system, there's a potential for a great deal of consciousness. And the sun is certainly quite the complex environment, but if the sun's a complex enough environment, then really every star is and a whole lot of other things too. And that's something to think about. You guys ever play with one of these? Hey, I've always thought that our planets or stars were a conscious being. I've always wondered if the Earth itself was conscious and it, it, it just couldn't communicate to us like how we communicate. It has its own ways of communication and we just don't listen. That It's always interested me. So I kind of fall in the line of believing this a little bit, but I would need to have more proof personally. The sun used to be yellow. I, I'm a photographer. Right. I've been shooting photographs since I was 10 years old. I've been photographing the sun since I was 10 years old. The sun used to be yellow. I have to use special filters, neutral density filters now, to get good crisp images of the sun because it's white. It's hot white. Mm -hmm. And this is an indication that dust is falling down, uh, interstellar dust is falling onto the surface of the sun, heating it up. And, if you, and another thing that people have noticed is the UV the ultraviolet right. is much hotter now than it used oh, to be. Oh, sure. And more well, melanoma can, cases. Exactly. And you can stand out in 80 degree weather and you feel like it's 100 degrees yeah. out. Uh, and that's the UV coming. And so I asked myself, well, where would the UV come? And the ultraviolet would come from this dust falling down onto the surface of the sun. It's called a T-Tari star in astronomy. Mm -hmm. And the dust falls down on the surface. And if you... Uh, if you um, add ultra, the, if you do a color scheme and you add the ultraviolet to yellow, it turns it white, which is exactly which is what's happening going on with the sun. It does seem like when I was much younger, I remember the sun being way more yellow than what it is now. Now it's just like this piercing white light that just beams down upon us. And it, it does make me wonder, is it really heating up to the point where now it's so hot that it's blazing white and it's no longer fire orange or yellow? Let me know what you guys think about this one. Oh my god, what is going on in the UK? Oh, I swear to god. If you're renting a house or an apartment, especially with a partner, you're probably gonna wanna watch this video. So first of all, as I'm sure you're aware, there's been a lot going on in the UK recently. Lots of new crazy rules coming into place. Vape bans, well they didn't, they just had tax on them. Everyone's getting poorer. This is now the second most depressing country in the whole world, apparently, according to statistics. Making kids study maths and English until they're 18. Like, where should we go? But now, for tenants, there are some new rules in place. Basically, you will not be allowed to have kids. So a lot of landlords, and there's been propositions from higher powers to make landlords enforce no sex tenancy clauses. So what does this mean? Well, this means if you sleep with someone in your own home, you could risk eviction and becoming homeless. So I've seen a lot of people who rent properties in the UK complaining about lots of things. Landlords just evicting them for no reason, having unstable properties, properties which are just an absolute mess, like they can just kick you out 
for no reason. So now adding this is just another excuse for them to be able to kick you out. But the one thing I've got to ask is how are they gonna know? Is there cameras in the houses? But yeah, lots of landlords are now actually starting to implement this, meaning this is actually gonna be a rule for some people. Don't even know what to say, to be honest, mate. But if you rent, please let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. And as always, hit that follow button and I'll keep you updated. I'm curious to anybody watching this that lives in the UK, is this an actual fact that's going down? Because like this individual said, I would also like to know how do they know if it's no intercourse in general. Now, if they're saying no producing offsprings, then I understand that as well. But to say no intercourse is kind of like, really? Like, how are you going to know that unless there is a birth that happens from the fact? Also, what if you're into the same sex? Like, what if man and man or woman and woman, like, can they not? This is for those of you who are awake. I think I've been awake for five to six years now, partially awake prior to that. Um, I have over time through research realized that everything I was taught in school, our history was a lie. All of it. It's all a lie. We haven't been told the truth about anything. Um, I, I, I don't, I don't believe anything we've been told is the truth. It, it, it is so far off from the truth. It's scary. Um, who else on the side of being awake? Like, if you know you're awake, you know you're awake. But who else on the awake side are having a really hard time interacting with people who are completely asleep? Like, I have, I can't, I can't just get together with people and be like, oh, yeah, the weather is, uh, sports. Oh, let's, yeah. How's the kids? And not talk about the fact our country's being invaded. We are losing. This is the fall of Rome. We are living through the fall of Rome right now. Our country is being invaded. Our government has been taken over. There was a coup involved. The people running our government right now are all paid off and corrupt. Every one of them. I don't care. Congress, Senate, House, doesn't matter. I think they're, most of them are compromised. Um, they're not representing the people at all. And I'm just at the point where I want something to happen. I'm done. I'm done. I can't, I can't, I get up and go to work every day. I'm like, why am I doing this? What is this for? So it can all end next week when our government decides to fucking poison us or whatever they're going to do. I, I just, <sighs> it's frustrating. It's so frustrating. Make something happen. I don't care. It can be bad. Have the UN show up and knock on my door and arrest me. What, whatever you, whatever you motherfuckers have planned for us, let's just do it. Because I, this waiting game is getting really old. I'm tired. I'm really tired. Hey, I get what this guy's saying. I do not personally consider myself awake yet. I, I'm not really a huge fan of that whole phrase anyways, but I do see what this individual is saying. When you're way more open-minded and you're around people that are not as open-minded as you and they're just okay with the norms of the world or their country, it does seem a little shallow to communicate these things because people get really defensive, they get scared, and they just try to avoid the subject altogether. And I get it, it's really difficult to save up enough money and move to a different country but maybe if you're on this line you should probably try your best to save up as much money as you can to go to a different country and see if it's any better you know do some research ask some people around of what countries they feel like are the better countries and just try moving there and seeing if that's more for you if it's more woke if you will because just sitting here talking about it on social media isn't really going to do much better you know what I'm saying? But again, that's probably because I'm asleep still, I'm not quite awake, and I don't understand the big picture. But when I see things like that, it's like, uh, you really could probably do something a little bit more about this. Do you see demons? Because they're talking about a condition where you can see demon faces in normal people's faces. Well guys, I found something crazy with this. I'm gonna show you a quick video of explanation with it, but stick around for the end part because it's literally mind-boggling.
the weird stuff I love. Imagine your vision is totally normal, and then one day you see demonic features everywhere on people only, just like this, what you see behind me. Now, that's a reality for a man named Victor Shera. He has extremely rare yet terrifying disorder called PMO, and no, it's commonly known as, or now known because... People didn't know about it at first. It's called the demon face syndrome. All right, stick with me because this is going to sound crazy. But I literally think they made up this condition. So when the eclipse comes and hits us with some sort of positive energy and we literally get our powers back and we can see the demons and tell who's a demon and who's not, they want us to just think we have this condition. But here's the even crazier part. Remember the guy's name they said, who they said has this condition? Victor Shara, well, I plugged that name into the Gematria calculator. There it is right there. Victor Shara gives a value of 1210. Now, watch what I found. Tell me if any of these stick out to you. A few of them stick out to me. Specifically, this one. But that's not the one I'm talking about. That's the one I'm talking about. If you watch any of my things, you know I like to talk about how they tell us and they put things in plain sight. Well, that wasn't as much in plain sight. I had to dig for it a little, but I literally thought something like that is what I would find, and it was right there. I don't know, guys. I think something big is coming. I really do. And I just have to say this to say this, but of course, this was all for entertainment purposes. I didn't mean a word I said. I've been seeing this float around the internet of this individual that got this really rare syndrome where he sees deformed faces now. I do not necessarily know if I believe the eclipse is going to grant us powers. I mean, it, maybe it will, and I kind of hope it does. That would be a very interesting life to live. But I don't know if I believe that... They're trying to set us up for the normality of being able to see this kind of stuff. It's interesting nonetheless. They're just used to seeing so many normal faces and all of a sudden now everyone looks really different. That's pretty bizarre. I, I would like to know what caused this to happen to that individual to make him start seeing all of these different odd shaped faces because that's pretty nuts. Do you think that this has anything to do with an object or objects outside of our solar system? It's one of the possibilities you have to consider. Give me a second one. That they live here, that they've always lived here. Meaning? That they've always lived on Earth, that they've been here longer than us, that they're crypto-terrestrials. Maybe they live in the ocean. Maybe they live here, separated from us by some thin psychic dimensional membrane that they that move back and forth. There are a lot of exotic ideas that have been explored and discussed behind closed doors. The crypto-terrestrial hypothesis basically sort of maintains that we are sharing the planet with a species that's possibly as far in advance of us as we are as from chimpanzees uh, in certain areas of, of development. Not necessarily everything. We obviously have some, some things that the, that the alleged uh, crypto-terrestrials or CTs, as I refer to them for brevity, um, don't have, like a, a global infrastructure. Um, I think it seems likely to me that the, that, the, that the CT has utilized imagery that we associate with extrasolar aliens uh, to disguise their presence, to kind of mask where they're coming from, and to throw us off the scent. Uh, I think one thing that this, this secret civilization among us uh, has going for it is a very prolonged and uh, maintained and very well-cultivated sense of stealth. I think that they thrive on secrecy. I think that's a big asset. I think they're flesh and blood. I think a lot of them could possibly pass for human. And uh, I think that they, they share the planet with us. And uh, I think they're nomadic. And it, it seems to me that they are... Uh... here to stay in the sense that they've been here a long time. If you look at folklore, we find recurring references to them um, in different, in different uh, disguises. But then again, that seems to be kind of the hallmark of the whole thing. I think that UFOs are their latest disguise because we automatically associate that with, with aliens from other planets. And there's nothing, there's nothing inherently unsound about the extraterrestrial hypothesis, and it's not mutually incompatible with the crypto-terrestrial idea. But uh, nevertheless, I think that that when we look at the evidence of like hybridization programs like Bud Hopkins and David Jacobs, I don't see 
what sense that would really make if it's an extracellular species interacting with us, why they would have any interest in human DNA like, like they're alleged to have. On the other hand, if we share a common ancestor with these beings, these people, uh, it begins to make sense. And when you look at certain cases that have reproductive overtones, uh, it's very interesting to consider that we're dealing with a genetically impoverished species right here on Earth that is utilizing us for uh, genetic stock. Uh, because it's very likely that if the cryptoterrestrials are indeed real and indeed sharing the planet with us, that they are marginalized and that they have a very uh, compromised population. If that's so, then they might very well need uh, to replenish their genetic stock from time to time. And to do so under the, under the auspices of being aliens from another star system, another planet, would be would fall right into kind of what we expect and it would be the perfect smoke screen i think i think it would be very effective and i think uh, it would fool a great many people and if you look at popular culture where uh, we tend to be fascinated by accounts of aliens to the point where we the word aliens is synonymous with the extraterrestrial hypothesis but i don't think the extraterrestrial idea is the final word i think it's worth considering but i also think that the idea that we're sharing the planet as ludicrous as it may sound when you first consider it has some good circumstantial evidence to, uh, to back it up and to complement some of the ideas associated with it that that's a pretty cool theory to me i really enjoy it and it makes a lot more sense that there probably were extremely advanced civilizations in the past that just figured out how to adapt with the lower civilization that's not as advanced they're like okay well we're with these people they aren't quite there like we are but we have to blend in because they're way too hostile or whatever the case may be i find this pretty interesting and i mean that can tie in with so many other things as well it could be anunnaki just still living amongst us what if cern created a quantum camera which can take a quantum photograph of all of reality if that were true it would make the Large Hadron Collider the perfect fit for the mystery machine associated with Project Looking Glass. Everybody and their mom knows that you don't need the largest structure ever built in human history to smash particles together. And most of us are getting the sinking suspicion that CERN is responsible for all the insane things that are happening in the world right now. So let's discuss my quantum camera theory and how it connects to the idea of collapsing timelines and why things have gotten so damn strange in the world. I propose that the Large Hadron Collider might be capable of taking a quantum photograph of the entire Earth. In what ways would this differ from just taking a giant photograph of the entire Earth? Well, for one, it would be three-dimensional. And two, it would see every single particle in its quantum position across the entire planet. I'm talking every particle. When it took its picture, it could show the scientists every neutrino, neutron, photon, proton, gluon, you name it, and its exact position around the world. You might be wondering, what does that mean, why is it important, and how would it explain all the strange things happening in our world right now? Well, that's where it gets really interesting. Because if this looking glass machine could take a picture right now in this moment and see every single particle in its position, and then take another picture in the next moment, it could understand the vectors of all the particles. Now, in layman's terms, this just means speed and direction. So if it could figure out the speed and direction of every particle, let's say, across the Earth, it could figure out where it was going. And then it could figure out where it was going to be in the future. And if you had enough powerful supercomputers, you could take all that quantum data and retranslate it into regular data. So then they could have an actual three-dimensional photograph of reality as human beings perceive it. What I just told you is a reasonable hypothesis for how we could build a machine that would be a literal crystal ball. Now let's say that's what CERN does, and let's say it is the mysterious machine behind Project Looking Glass. And let's say they can see as far as 10 years into the future, and they know every single quantum particle and where it's going to be in that future because they can just take all the data of the vectors and speeds now and say, well, if this is happening now, this obviously has to happen in the next point. And so they actually create a deterministic view of what the reality is going to be. So what if the people in control of this machine didn't like what they saw? Maybe they saw themselves lose power. Well, then they'd have to change things. But how exactly would they do that? 
Like and follow for part two. I would have never have considered that to be what the CERN technology was being used for. I would have thought maybe opening up a portal to a different dimension, but maybe that's the after effects of gaining this photo technology that they're trying to capture. I thought this was a pretty interesting theory and I, I really enjoyed it. I'm sure to some people there's a lot of mathematical problems that are impossible for this subject, but to me, it sounded pretty concrete and I enjoyed that. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing for us because for the person that has the ability to see the future, what are they going to change if they do not like the future and how do they change it? How do they gain that type of control and power to change the future from what they've seen? We talked about the history of the Illuminati, the all seeing eye. Mm -hmm. And that is a hundred percent a Freemason symbol. Yeah. I think, but the, who owns the majority of stocks, you know, it's like, well, somebody owns everything. Right. Yeah. And I think, I'm going to say it. I think it's the Illuminati a group of people, group. secret of group. Yeah. It's like, whatever that is. Cause I know when people hear Illuminati, there is a group of people, obviously that are very powerful, that are very greedy. And what's creepy too, in 2010, the federal reserve had a hundred year anniversary party on Jekyll Island. What we had before the federal reserve was trading. Was, no, what we had were their privately owned banks that were in control of their own currency. So they said, before the Federal Reserve, it was risky to get into banking because you never had someone to bail you out. So if like, because the whole point of a bank was you would have money and it was really meant for farmers. Yeah. If you have a crop to grow, they would come borrow from you with interest. They would grow their crops, sell it, pay you back with interest. So that was a private bank, right? Yeah. Um, and that's what it was before that. But we dismantled that and just created a centralized bank where everyone has to follow their rules now. They, they dictate the interest rates. Yeah. Nationwide interest rates, the Federal Reserve does. So they hike up pricing on everything just to, they're trying to destroy the dollar to create this new globalist one new currency. I believe this pretty much 100%. I do think that the Federal Reserve is trying to create a general currency for the world. It's just a one type of currency so that they don't have to fluctuate and balance all of these other currency types. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I have a feeling it's going to be a completely all digital thing with some exceptions of people that have no digital capabilities or that could completely eliminate them altogether. The, the, the government and the system is pretty messed up, so it wouldn't surprise me if that was the plan. Let me know in the comments on your thoughts about this because this could be a touchy subject for a lot of people. A lot of people believe that they're never going to do that, and there's some people that are extremely firm on believing that's going to happen. And I kind of lean on the more of that's going to happen probably within the next 20 or so years. A woman says she's exhausted by the fact that she can't afford rent even though she's cut back on eating. There's a woman on TikTok who is going viral right now because her rent went from $1,300 to $1,800 a month with no warning. That is a significant amount of money for your rent to increase to the point where that would make or break somebody's ability to pay rent. Landlords and corporations are continuing to price gouge and not care about the well-being of their tenants or their customers or anybody because it's all about money, 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 money at this point. I would recommend that this girl see if she can find a cheaper place, but with the increase of rent, is that possible? I have no idea. It is gonna take a lot of work to get out of that situation. She's either gonna have to get a second job if she doesn't already have one or scrape up some funds to figure out if she can move to a cheaper place, get a bunch of roommates. I mean, it, none of it is ideal. $500 could prevent you from saving money monthly too, which is something that I come on here and preach about. Taking your savings, putting it into a high yield savings or a compound interest account, watching your money grow. How are we supposed to do that when it's $500 increasing in rent? Like that's, that's insane. I would love for people to just stop being selfish and let people live their lives. That big of a price increase, there's no way you can save money if you're living a life that's sustained by what it currently was. Because normally when your rent is a certain price, you kind of work your life around that rent. Well, okay, I got a couple hundred dollars for food. I got this for gas. I got that for rent. Now I'm penny pinching almost. And then it goes up $500. Now you're really penny pinching. You're pinching dust at this point. It's, it's really crazy. I hear the story about Albert Einstein and the person he said the smartest person he ever met. His wife? Albert Einstein. No. He was I German. I doubt it. <laughs> no, so he had a chauffeur and he referred to him as the smartest person he's ever met for this reason. 
he was touring and he was giving all these lectures and um, he had to give this speech. He ended up getting really, really, really sick. And he was like, I can't go up. I can't give this lecture. And his chauffeur was like, I've been with you for years. I listen to you do this every night. Let me do it. And so he gives the speech, kills it. And then uh, at the very end of the thing, somebody asks this really complex question. Pretending to be Albert Einstein. And he's like, sir, that is such a simple question. Even my chauffeur can answer it. <laughs> and he literally points down at Albert Einstein. <laughs> Einstein gets up and kills it, and no one else that asks any questions. Is so funny. Now, hey, that's he's a smart. Comedic genius, too. Hey. Hey. And some say that's the smartest type. Mm. Mm. I say that. Hey, if this was a true story, that's pretty neat. I'm not going to lie. It makes sense. If you're with someone for long enough, you kind of know their patterns to respond a certain way. That's pretty neat. Richard Harris, the actor who played the first Dumbledore, later in his life, he saw a picture with him sitting in front of a Rolls Royce. And he's like, I don't have a Rolls Royce. He's like, I've never owned a Rolls Royce. And it said that he was like so confused by it and asked everyone he knew. He's like, do I own a Rolls Royce that I like, don't know yeah. about? And then it said that he like contacted his two ex-wives. He's like, did I ever buy a Rolls Royce for me or you? You guys? And they're like, no. Turns out he had a drinking problem. <gasps> oh, no. And he was in New York and this guy gifted him a Rolls Royce and he left it in a parking garage in New York City no. completely forgot about it for like over 20 years it's still there still there and the parking fee was over $400 a month <gasps> no so he paid way. over $90,000 to have this Rolls Royce parked there but he's so rich like he's just like yeah he's got the he's Hogwarts like, I don't money know what, I don't know what this bill is but yeah <laughs> oh my gosh but he, had a, he owned a Rolls Royce and dude completely forgot about it that is insane could you imagine owning a Rolls Royce Rolls Royce Royce, Royce and forgetting about it. You know you have a lot of money when you can let something like that slide because ninety thousand dollars in total of how much you've paid for it over the years is crazy. Must be nice though. All right, guys, I'm gonna go ahead and end this episode here. As always, if you are interested in any of these clips, links are in the description down below. And with that being said, have a good day. <laughs>